If you have to read a label, you should put the package back because there shouldn't be a label on a head of lettuce. The best way to suppress your immune system is sugar. All of us have the power to heal ourselves. Many of us are so unaware of the foods we eat and how it affects our bodies. And in this interview, Dr. Stephen Gundry teaches us the key foods to be eating to live a longer, healthier life. How can we boost and protect our immune system in time of pandemic, crisis, stress, and overwhelm? What are the things we can do right yeah. now? So the first thing you do is you absolutely positively stay away from simple carbohydrates. Mm. And I can tell you that if it's in a package, it is probably a simple carbohydrate, even what would appear to be healthy. So um, plantain chips. Um, no, yeah. I can't eat those. Come on. Read the label and it will scare you to death. Will I eat plantain chips? Sure I will, but I will use them as a dipping chip to get guacamole in my mm -hmm. mouth. Or olive oil. Or olive oil, yeah. So, <sighs> yeah, I know. So you stay away from simple carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And what's really scary in times of pandemics mm -hmm. is the grocery store shelves are empty <laughs> of bread and bagels and pasta ah, and tomato sauce that's good for and you. milk and ice cream and orange juice there's five to six teaspoons of, of sugar. sugar in a cup of orange juice so it's actually good when the shelves are cleared of all the bad things that's right believe it or not right now most of everything in the grocery store is actually good for you because it's all been cleared out of all the bad stuff mm -hmm. but what worries me is all that bad stuff is being consumed yeah. and the best way to suppress your immune system is sugar mm. sugar absolutely suppresses white blood cell function so please don't eat like that okay but luckily the stores are and and the other thing i remind all my listeners is that we are the only creature that needs or uses toilet paper <laughs> right and if you follow my program you won't need it you will not <clears throat> need toilet paper i <laughs> i have many <laughs> friends that say they don't need a wipe yeah maybe you take one little yeah. piece yeah, just, one to little piece, sure. just to make sure just make sure yeah, but you yeah, never know yeah and so you know i know when you know i've got some issue that you know that i need, need toilet more, paper. more than one piece <laughs> of toilet paper yeah, so if you're if you need toilet paper, I got news for you. You got a leaky gut. You're eating the wrong. Things. You're eating the wrong stuff. So no simple carbs. Essentially, if it's in a package, it's probably not good. No sugar. It suppresses the immune system. What else? Um, either so hurts you know, the immune system. You know, what boosts the immune system? Yeah. So what boosts the immune system? It turns out that um, olive oil, mm -hmm. the polyphenols in olive oil, actually really boost the immune system. So do components of mushrooms. And, you know, I, I make one and we'll get you some called M Vitality, which is a mushroom extract. But mushrooms in general, even the humble button mushroom will actually boost your immune system. And it does that actually by having the sort of complex sugars that your gut bacteria really, really wants love. and needs. Exactly. And, and so it's more of an indirect effect. You give your gut bacteria what they want and need. They in turn will tell the immune system, hey, we got this. And mm -hmm. you know, relax and enjoy yourself. Wow. The other thing, every human being that I see initially with leaky gut or autoimmune <clears throat> disease has a low vitamin D level. Mm -hmm. uh, I had Mark Hyman on my podcast recently, and Mark has never seen vitamin D toxicity. Mm -hmm. I have been measuring vitamin D levels for over 20 years now. I have never seen vitamin D toxicity. Uh, I you can't have too much necessarily. I, yeah, I have yet to see it. Uh, right. Could it exist? I mean, if you have a whole bottle a day, maybe it's yeah. not good. Yeah, well, and actually Dr. Hollick from Boston University, who's really the world expert on vitamin D, has seen it only once. And that was in a physician who by accident was taking a million international units of vitamin D3 a day for six months. That's a lot. That's a lot. Now, <laughs> what is that, a whole cup full a day that, or something? Well, he had been getting it from a compounding pharmacist okay. and it had been mislabeled. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't doing it on purpose. Um, right. But for instance, I, I 
I run my vitamin D level greater than 120 nanograms per milliliter, and I have for 18 years to prove I'm not dead. Right. So many of the labs now are coming around to saying 120 is absolutely normal, and it's not vitamin D toxic. I have patients, uh, I may have told you this story, it's a great sure. story, years ago, I had two people in their late 70s, first time, and we get vitamin D levels. Back in those days, we could actually quant we'd quantify the vitamin D level, and the vitamin D was 270, both of them. Uh, and you know, I'm looking at them, and I was young and naive, and I'm thinking, you know, why aren't these guys dead? And I said, you guys take a lot of vitamin D, don't you? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's an anti-aging uh, vitamin. And mm. I said, it actually is. But um, I said, well, how long have you been doing that? And they said, oh, all of our lives. And I'm going, you know, you look pretty healthy to me. Yeah. And <laughs> in theory, vitamin D can give you kidney stone, mm. toxic vitamin D levels. Never seen it, but in theory. Uh, any kidney stones? No, why? Um, and the other theory is it makes your fingers and toes numb. Mm. And I said, uh, any you know, fingers, toes, numb? No, why? And I'm going, huh. you know, huh? So that's when I actually started researching vitamin D. And for instance, the University of California, San Diego says that the average American should take 9,600 international units a day to have a safe level of vitamin D. Hmm. The other thing that's fascinating is most people with cancer have low levels of vitamin D. And there's some very interesting trials of boosting vitamin D in people who have cancer hmm. to prevent recurrences. So, um, right now, uh, I, I think everybody should be taking 5,000 international units, but right now... A day? A day. Uh, right now, we're probably wise to boost it to 10,000 a day. Wow. I'll give you an example. Uh, last week when this started, and I still see patients every day, um, I took 100,000 units on Monday, I took 50,000 <laughs> units on Tuesday, and I took 25,000 units on Wednesday, and then hit 10,000 units. If I feel I'm coming down with something, you take more about I will take 150,000 units three days in a row. 50,000 three times a day for three days. That's nearly a half a million international units of vitamin D in three days. Wow. And I'm not dead. Uh, I have my patients do the same thing. Uh, none of <clears> them <throat> have died. None of them have gotten vitamin D toxicity. But I can tell you, it always cuts whatever. It's one of the most effective antivirals there is. The second thing we need to do is we need to get, if you can, time to release vitamin C. Linus Pauling was right. Vitamin C is incredibly antiviral, but what he didn't know is we can't absorb enough vitamin C and keep it in our bloodstream because comes out. it comes out very, very quickly. So get yourself some time-release vitamin C. The stores are empty. Amazon's empty. Right. But in the future, bar <laughs> barring that, in the future, barring that, go to, it's still there. I go to health food stores every yeah, day and yeah, just yeah. kind of check and see what's there and what isn't. Get yourself just the chewable tablets yeah, or get good. the capsules and take it four times a day. Take mm -hmm. 500 to 1,000 four times a day. Yeah, it's still better than nothing. Right? It's still better than nothing. Uh, zinc is a great idea. Get about 30 milligrams of zinc. I'm a big fan of quercetin, sometimes pronounced quercetin. It's a compound that's present in the white pith of citrus, it's in apples and it's in onions, mm -hmm. and it actually may be the compound that the old wives tale and apple a day keeps the doctor away. Right. So quercetin is also very antiviral. Okay. And there's an exciting new paper that was just published yesterday that astaxanthin uh, seems to prevent the inflammatory response to the coronavirus. Hmm. Asta Astaxanthin. It is a, a compound that actually makes salmon red. Um, and salmon eat algae and plankton that have, that produce astaxanthin. It's, uh, 
Yeah, it's it's a really cool compound. Wow. Yeah. Do you think it's possible that we could defend and arm our bodies and our immune system can be so strong that if any virus like the coronavirus came in our mouth and was in us that we could reject it and not attach to our bodies? Correct. That's the whole it's, idea. Really? It's you, possible you, to do that? You are designed to, to defend it. Just to block them all. It. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And it's, we like a, it's like a fullback running through, just blocking everyone so you can score. Yeah. It, you are designed to do that. I when mean, your immune system is strong, then you, you don't get sick. You don't get sick. And it doesn't matter how strong the virus is, you should be able to defend against it. It's when it's weak when you start to get sick. That's exactly right. Wow. And, you know, I mean, you have different parts of your immune system lined up on all your mucous membranes, mm -hmm. ready for, you know, what's coming. And what's unfortunate is, in a lot of our patients with leaky gut and with autoimmune diseases, we can actually measure that they're very deficient in the immune system that makes, for instance, IgA, which lines are the walls of our gut and IgM, which is the second line of defense. And we can see that when we get their gut sealed, that, wow, their immune system is back. All their numbers are back up to normal. But that's what's happening. So again, the reason mm -hmm. people with chronic diseases are susceptible to the virus is not because they have a chronic disease. It's because that is a sign of, that a gut. of a leaky gut and your immune system is impaired. Hey, it's Lewis here, and I would love to connect directly with you. Text me the word YouTube to my number 614-350-3960 to receive weekly inspirational messages from me. So I have olive oil yeah. and vitamin D, have lots of vitamin D, three, D3. D3. And then what's next to okay. live a long life? Next is you got to get some form of long chain omega-3 fat, be better known as fish oil. Mm. And vegans have no excuse anymore. There is algae-based DHA and EPA. But here's the deal. Your brain uh, is about 70% fat. So if you want to call me a fathead, you know, I, I will You'll bat take you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I can just see now the internet um, lighting up. <laughs> and me and is a fan. <laughs> fathead. So half of the fat in your brain is actually an omega-3 fat called DHA. So half, basically half of your brain mm -hmm. is fish oil. Wow. And as I talk about in the longevity paradox, you look at people what are called the omega-3 index, which basically looks at how much DHA you have in you over the past two months. People with the highest omega-3 index have the largest brains and the largest areas of memory, the hippocampus. People with the lowest levels of DHA have the most shrunken brains and the smallest memory areas, hippocampus. Mm. So mom was right. When she said fish is brain food, you know, she was absolutely, she didn't know why it was, but we now know it's DHA is really what makes your brain. So sushi is good. Sushi is actually not a good idea. Oh, wow. Most of the people I see with high mercury levels are sushi eaters or dentists. Uh, so, and particularly huh. sashimi grade tuna. God, it's you so good, just want to just kind of so want to stay away from it. Ah, oh, sugar Sorry. fish is amazing though. Yeah, and tono, and you know. it's got the grains too. Yeah, it's got the fit. grains, you know. So, so no sushi. Yeah, so just, once in a while. Yeah, once in a while. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so fish oil is incredibly important. Yeah, and what I try to get people to do, and again, I measure this every three months in all my patients, and we're talking, you know thousands and thousands of patients over the last 20 years you want to get about a thousand milligrams of dha per day now how do you do that well you get fish oil i mean you can go to costco I don't right, care. Right, right. and you look on the back and you find serving size and make sure it says one serving size uh -huh. they love to fool you uh, they may say two or three right, right, and then you look down below and you see dha and you look to see how much dha is in a capsule and you add it up and say, oh, okay, there's 250 milligrams of DHA in this capsule, so I need to take four. Wow. Four a day. Yeah. Or well, a thousand I mean, a day. A thousand a day. Yeah. yeah. A thousand a day. Okay. DHA. 
we got olive oil. We've got uh, vitamin D3. We have fish oils. What else do we need to live longer? So you got to have polyphenols in your diet. So poly- <laughs> what the polyphenol? heck is a polyphenol? <laughs> How do you remember polyphenol? Th- think about polyphenol. Okay. Um, phenols are plant compounds. Polyphenols are plant compounds that plants use primarily to protect themselves uh. against stress and sunlight. Uh-huh. Uh, just interesting fact. We know that red wine is beneficial for you because of actually two polyphenols. The most famous is resveratrol. The other one is quercetin or quercetin. The higher the grapes are grown, the higher in altitude the grapes are grown, the more polyphenols they make. Because they need more to protect themselves. Yeah, right? Exactly. It's basically uh, suntan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they've actually protected themselves against sunburn. Interesting. Also, the more the plant is stressed, the more polyphenols it makes to protect itself. Right. Okay? So, polyphenols are traditionally in dark colored berries. So, for instance, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Interesting fun fact, the leaves of these trees or vines have more polyphenols than the actual fruit does. Hmm. So, for instance, black raspberry leaves have far more polyphenols than black raspberries. Um, And I take black raspberry capsules, oh, by the way, and it's in the book. There you go. Um, So... Olives, for instance, are loaded with polyphenols, huh. and olives that are stressed uh, produce even better. are even better. Wow. Olive leaves have more polyphenols than olives, so olive leaf extract is an easy way of getting the huge amount of benefits without drinking a liter of olive oil. So do you, what about like, uh, you know, leafy greens? Do yeah. you want stressed out looking leafy greens or do you want healthy, thriving Excellent looking? Excellent question. It turns out that the reason organic vegetables in general are better for you, besides the fact that they haven't been sprayed with pesticides mm-hmm. and herbicides and probably Roundup, and we can get into that, is the fact that these Creatures, these plants, actually have to work harder, huh. and they have to produce more polyphenols to protect themselves against insect predation. And so that's actually the reason you want to eat organic. So when you're going to the farmer's market and the poor little organic vegetables have got pockholes of, <laughs> of insects like and, they're dying. and they <laughs> don't look very good, you go, I want that guy. Really? That guy is struggling. He is going to just be so loaded with polyphenols. Really? And correlation with that is the more bitter the better because polyphenols in general yeah. are very bitter uh, for instance when uh, we were developing you know my signature product vital reds it's pure polyphenols primarily mm. and they're bitter so we did lots of taste testing to figure out how the heck we're going to mask these mm. really bitter compounds so more bitter more better that even you know, really good organic eaters, most human beings only eat maybe 20 different plant species. Mm-hmm. Um, I, prob- I probably eat like three. Yeah, yeah. yeah most people do. <laughs> like five maybe. Yeah, it's a- you know, and, and you know, ketchup is not a vegetable. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a tomato a- and we can't, <laughs> we can't, we, do, we that, can't yeah. do that. So our, an- our ancestors, and even looking at modern hunter-gatherers like the Hansa tribe, they go through, they eat, 250 different plant species on a rotating mm-hmm. basis. And you think about it, all those plants are grown organically. Uh, they're in six feet of loam soil. They got their cool microbiome. So they're just replete with all these nutrients and polyphenols. And so, you know, if people think that they can actually do a great job eating healthy uh, without supplementation, mm-hmm. uh, I got oceanfront property in Palm Springs. I'm happy to sell them. the nut butter that I can eat that's actually okay so uh, is there one yeah so interestingly enough we have a number of people with rheumatoid arthritis who react to the peel of an almond Mm. there is a lectin in the peel of almonds you take the peel off you take the peel off and skinned almonds are okay yeah so like Marcon almonds and there are actually a couple of companies that now make peeled almond butter and you can find them. Really? Yeah. It shouldn't be an issue then. It shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. So um, 
if you're going to choose... That's interesting. Yeah, so walnuts are a great choice. Pistachios are a great choice. Every time I eat a walnut, I sneeze. Uh, so there are some tannins in walnuts that certain people react to. <laughs> so stay with, stay with pistachios. Uh, macadamia nuts. I love macadamia yeah, nuts. They're really good. Okay. Um, Mac nuts are okay. Yeah, so, but yeah, so get yourself some peeled almonds. I'm going to do that now. Try it. Okay. Uh, you said American milk is something that we should not have in order to fix leaky gut. Yeah. Is there such thing as non-American milk that is okay to drink? Yeah, so most people can have sheep milk, can have goat milk. Interestingly enough, uh, goat milk uh, traditionally was called mother's milk because the, con the components in goat milk are very different than hmm. cow milk. Yeah. Uh, they're far more similar to human milk. Wow. And so I actually tell mothers if they're going to you know, give their child some animal milk, please make it goat milk yeah, rather okay. than cow's milk. Okay. And uh, is, is there any other foods that we yeah, should so, not eat to heal our uh, leaky gut? So the, the more... The more you, and I need to talk about this in Plant Paradox as well. But yeah, uh, the more you, there are a few people that actually react to either the white or the yolk of eggs. Most mm -hmm. people don't. Okay, but th we test for those. And mm -hmm. here's just something to throw out. Yes. I don't want to cause widespread panic. Yes, there is a. <laughs> There's already enough of that in the world right now. That's right. Yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> There is a lectin in spinach mm. that um, I was unaware of, but thanks to a company called Vibrant America, they discovered that there are a class of lectins called aquaporins, and they're present in tobacco, they're present in spinach, they're present in corn, they're present in soybeans, they're present in uh, green peppers, and I wow. think that's it. Uh, anyhow, they actually can cause leaky gut and they can cause leaky brain. Mm. And I stumbled upon this because I have a few people with really bad IBS and really bad autoimmune disease who are saints. They follow my program. They never cheat. Why would they? Why do they still have and, and they, issues? Yeah, why do they still have issues? And so when we had these new tests, lo and behold, almost every one of these people reacted to spinach. No way. And they ate a lot of spinach. Wow. And knock on wood so far, when we took the spinach away from them, uh, that was the key. Now, don't everybody go home and throw out your spinach. But if you're following my program and my program does have spinach in it and mm -hmm. we're still having problems, Take it out. consider giving up spinach. There's no human need for spinach. Now you said, uh, what was her name? Is she a Dr. Terry? Is that her name? Terry Walls, Dr. Terry Walls. You said she was doing like 10 or 12 cups of veggies a day for- yeah, Nine cups of vegetables. The, the snake uh, looking back at you. Yeah. Now what should those, now why is it important to have nine cups of vegetables and what does that do for your microbiome? So, your gut every day. This is so getting back to Dr. David Kessler, yes. head of the FDA. We thought that carbohydrates were carbohydrates and you know, and complex carbohydrates, uh, starches were fine because they're complex carbohydrates. Uh -huh. Everybody's wrong. Uh, food manufacturers have figured out how to make a complex carbohydrate a simple carbohydrate and make you think it's a complex carbohydrate. Okay. So, when you read a label, Number one, if you have to read a label, you're probably, you should put the package back because there shouldn't be a label on a head of lettuce. <laughs> right. <laughs> Give you an example. But you have to take, and if anybody, if the take home point from this is, we're, we're, we'll save so many people's lives. Mm. Read total carbohydrates on the label, then take away the dietary fiber. That'll be the next thing under it. So that will tell you the amount of grams of sugar per serving in that package. Do not look at where it says sugar. sugar. Do not look at added sugar. Mm. It is a lie. So it says zero sugar, zero added sugar. Yeah. So let me give you an example that he used on my podcast, which was a great example. He said, let me, what would you find in a store? The label says it's 300 calories. It has zero fat, it has zero grams of sugar, 
and it has four grams of protein and it has 35 grams of carbohydrates. Is that broccoli? I don't know. What is that? <laughs> it's a bagel. A bagel. A bagel. And wow. 300 and calories. 300 calories. Wow. Zero sugar. How does that have zero sugar? I thought the that's just I it. it the, turns into sugar. the label law lies wow. Wow. to you. It's got 35 grams of carbohydrates. Now, to make that it turns make into sense, sugar, right? which is sugar, it is pure sugar. In fact, it is better than sugar the way it has been manufactured. So wow. you take to figure out how much that is. There's four grams of sugar per teaspoon. So let's take his 35 grams of sugar, divide by four, let's make it easy, make it 36 grams. That's nine teaspoons of raw sugar in that bagel. Like a bagel. So that's number one. All of a sudden you have... How many grams of sugar would that be? That's, well, so a, a Coke, a 12 ounce Coke is like about what? 12 grams of sugar. Wow. So you're basically chugging a Coke when you when eat a bagel. A bagel. And it'll actually get into your bloodstream faster no. than if you chugged a Coke. No way. How is it going faster when it's just because liquid? Because it's been broken down. You actually have to digest the sugar molecule in the Coke. You don't have to digest the sugar molecule in a bagel. Really? Yeah, in main, main lines. So that's number one. Number two, what nobody knew was the bacteria that most of your bacteria live down in your colon and your lower part of your small intestine. And they're waiting for the complex carbohydrates that you do not digest normally. They're waiting for their meal that always used to come. And that meal never comes anymore because everything's been so finely processed that we don't get those complex carbohydrates yeah. down to them. So they starve to death. Mm. Now, what's really cool is that those guys take that meal and they make all these really cool compounds that, number one, keep the wall of the gut intact, allow the wall of the gut to heal itself, they make compounds that actually are text messages to the mitochondria in all of our cells, and particularly in our brain, that guys down in the engine room are working under full power, and we've got, you know, Scotty, beam me up sort of thing, you know, give me warp drive five, and we've got the power, and, you know, it's okay to go into hyperspace. If they don't make those compounds, your mitochondria go, Jeez, I'm not, I, I got nothing to work with here, and we got no backup system. Mm. I'm going to sputter down <clears throat> to a crawl. And people wonder why they're fatigued, even though right. they're eating more than ever, and they're eating all these sports drinks, and they're having you know, 12, 27 cups of coffee, and going, you know, where's my energy? Yeah. And it's because we no longer have this beautifully designed symbiotic rate relationship and we've starved mm. the most important part of, of us. And that's why Jack Lane said, if it tastes good, spit it out. So, so why <laughs> nine cups of vegetables then? Because that is actually giving those guys what they want to eat. Now, Terry doesn't, didn't know this back then, but her first book was Minding My Mitochondria or Feeding My Mitochondria. Mm -hmm. But now we know it's actually, we gotta feed those guys. We have to eat for them. Mitochondria. We gotta eat for the bacteria. The plant paradox is that there's certain plants that absolutely positively do not want us to eat them. At all, in at any all. circumstance. Under any Whether circumstance. you cook them or chop they, them or slice them or skin them, doesn't matter. They were here first and they had it really great before animals arrived because nobody wanted to eat them. And <laughs> my, you know, my, my research at Yale was in human evolutionary biology, so plants have the same evolutionary drive as animals. They mm. want to grow, and they want to have babies, seeds. They want to protect themselves. And they want to protect themselves. They don't want to die. They, exactly. Right. So when animals arrived, they had a problem because animals can run, they can hide, they can fight, but plants are stuck. 
But plants are chemists of incredible ability. Mm. So they can turn sunlight into matter like around your wall here. Wow. And so what they use is chemical warfare to actually defend themselves defend right. themselves yeah. and to even make animals do their bidding um, huh. because for instance I'll just throw out an example most plants want you to eat their fruits because the fruit contains go seed them. To, yes. to go reseed them yeah so you'll eat their fruit the seeds in the fruits are inedible and you'll either spit them out or if you swallow them they'll survive going through your intestines mm -hmm. and you'll poop them out someplace else fertilized and with fertilizer yeah. it's yeah. perfect yeah and they're away from mom and dad so for instance if an apple you know falls underneath the apple tree that poor kid doesn't have much of a chance because mom or dad is going to shade them the next year. But if it gets carried off, um, you know, even 100 feet away, and then it gets dropped, the plant does this on purpose. Crazy. And in fact, you and I love fruit because you and I were designed to eat fruit once a year in the summer to gain weight for the winter. Mm. So it was a really good trade-off uh, between, for instance, great apes and, and yeah, plants. Yeah. But the fascinating thing is manufacturers, food chemists know this, and we are drawn with color vision. And only animals that are fruit predators actually have color vision because you want to know when the fruit it's is ripe. ripe, when it has the highest sugar content. Right. And the plant wants you to know when it's ripe because that's when the seed finally has an impenetrable shell huh. and it doesn't want you to eat it before that time so Crazy. it tells you okay now's the time it's the shiniest object it's time to eat it yeah, yeah yeah you know so what colors does it use in general it uses reds and oranges and yellows to denote ripeness so the next time you're going down the snack aisles looking for all the great munchy stuff You'll be shocked that most of the companies use oranges, reds, yellows to get your attention because mm. it goes direct into the deep center of your brain and says, ooh, ooh, that, that color means I should eat it. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of calories and I'm going to be the big winner for the winter. Wow. Yeah. But if you're doing that every day, Big for many mistake. years in a row, yes. <laughs> you're so, always storing fat for the winter. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's part of the plant paradox yeah. is that once upon a time, we only had fruit in a very limited time mm -hmm. period. Now we have it accessible all the time. There were no 747s bringing blueberries to Costco in February. Mm -hmm. uh, they just weren't. So one of the weird things about our computer program is, like Tony Robbins is always fun to say, we, we run version 1.0 of our operating system. Uh -huh. We've never had an upgrade. And the same goes to the foods and the plants and the fruit we eat. So we were supposed to eat fruit once a year. And when we were eating fruit, our brain says, oh my gosh, it's summer. Winter is right around the corner. You know, we should eat this stuff because winter's a tough time, whether it's dry season, a rainy mm -hmm. season, a cold season. And we better store up fat, just like a bear. You know, yeah, bears yeah. eating all those blueberries and huckleberries. And they're storing fat for the winter. Right. So if you're eating blueberries at Costco in February that came from Chile, your operating system doesn't know it's February. Mm. It says, heck, it's August. And winter's right around the corner. So I better eat some more of this stuff. And this is one of the things that's happening to us in particularly American society, mm. but now most of the Western yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. We're eating things that we have no business eating really? 365 days a year. And most of us are just getting ready for the winter that never comes. Especially if you live in L.A. Yeah. It's never getting it, cold. Yeah, it never comes. You don't mm -hmm. need to store that fat. You really don't. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, that's part of the problem. My my staff always told me don't don't say this story because if people get the wrong idea, <laughs> Jack Lane. I got to know Jack Lane yeah. late, late in his life. Yeah, he was actually an advisor to our arthritis institute in Palm Springs, and 
So, you know, Jack was the godfather of fitness. I mean, mm -hmm. come on, let's give yeah. him a stew. The juicer. Yeah, the, the juicer. That was his big mistake. But anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, Jack and Lane used to have this expression is that if it tastes good, spit it out. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, I obviously like to sell books and my, you know, my staff said, don't say that because then they think you're, they're going to eat twigs and weeds and it's going to taste awful and, you know, you got to eat bad tasting food. Well, that's not what he meant. He actually meant that you should not be eating for this two inch by three inch piece of muscle, your tongue, but you should be eating for the microbiome, for the yeah. bacteria and <clears throat> all the other cute little viruses that actually live in your gut, live in your mouth, live on your skin. And if you eat for them, they will take care of you because mm -hmm. you are actually their home. Mm -hmm. We're merely a condominium for bugs. And, and how many bugs do we have on our body or in so, us? Yeah, we have time? well over a hundred trillion uh, bacteria. And since the Human Microbiome Project was, you know, finished about five years ago now, I mean, we didn't know that these guys really existed. Um, in fact, I was, uh, I was on my podcast, the Dr. Gundry podcast, we had Dr. David uh, Kessler, who was head of the FDA mm. in the Reagan years, who made the um, guidelines for the labels, the labeling laws on the back of packages that, you know, show saturated mm -hmm. fats and carbohydrates. And the labels, by the way, if we get into this, are completely wrong. Yeah. Um, they were forced on the Reagan administration by big food companies. Wow. And so, anyhow, you, if you feed bacteria what they want to eat, and that's just all in the longevity paradox, they will take care of you. They will not, they'll take care of the wall, the lining of your gut, and they, you will not actually age, mm. which is kind of cool. So if you take care of, of them, them, of the bugs in your body, you will not age. Right. So you got a hundred wow. trillion bacteria, you have over 10,000 different species of bacteria. And just last year, they discovered another thousand, so who knows? Right. So 99% of the genetic material that exists in you and me is non-human genetic material. Wow. We're only, our genes are actually so unimportant, it's kind of humorous. <laughs> and when people take a family history, what they're actually finding out is if you if your parents taught you how to eat and most people's parents teach the kids how to eat and your parents had diabetes or your parents had high blood pressure or your parents had coronary artery disease and you eat like your parents did the odds are that you will do that right for two reasons the food choices that you made but more importantly you inherited your bacteria mm. from your parents and actually your siblings and so it's not the genes of your parents that mean you are susceptible to heart disease or um, Alzheimer's or whatever right it's not the genes of your parents it's typically the the foods they ate that you're probably eating the exact same foods that cause the same type of problems correct yeah, right. I mean there are there's there is an Alzheimer's gene, and my program, according to Dale Bredesen, is the best way not to activate that gene. Um, and there are certain genes that people inherit that make the world's meanest, nastiest, stickiest cholesterol that most doctors don't even measure. And oh, by the way, if you're prescribed a statin drug, um, you know, a lipid-lowering drug, mm -hmm. it actually worsens the this other particle. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, there are genes, but they're such a small part. Uh, Nature magazine had a big article in <clears throat> late 2018, uh, I think, proving that only about seven or eight percent of what will happen to us is based on our genes and 
97 or 98 percent of what's going to happen to us <clears throat> is based on our environment and our food choices yeah, our and decisions our yeah. decisions yeah now you said we can you know aging is essentially a choice is what i'm hearing you say but if someone watching this saying well dr gundry you've got white hair you look older than when you were 10 years old so yes how, how can <laughs> so how can how can you say that you're you can eat certain things that can reverse aging or can make you not age when you look older than when you were younger. That's true. I, I'm definitely chronologically older. But uh, recently on my uh, podcast, uh, I had Dr. Terry Walls, who uh, I think is very famous, rightfully so, for uh, reversing her MS, her multiple wow. yeah, sclerosis. Uh, and she did it via diet. Uh, she did it initially by eating nine cups of vegetables a day. Mm. And uh, I, I dare people to try to eat nine cups of vegetables a, lot of a fiber, day. Right? A lot of fiber, right? A lot of fiber. And, and we'll, we'll get back to fiber because I think that's probably the key. And this is actually what Jack Elaine was trying to say. If it tastes good, spit it out. And Terry became famous for telling people that uh, she... When you look in the toilet every morning, you should see a very large coiled snake looking back up at you. <laughs> and in fact, in, in the plant paradox uh, in the, the original manuscript, I had said, when you look in the toilet, you should see a giant anaconda looking back up at you. <laughs> and my editor, uh, Julie Wills, you know, called me up, she said, uh, do you know there's a movie where yeah. an anaconda Snakes is coming, in the toilet. Yeah, coming out <laughs> coming out of the toilet? And I said, Oh yeah. She said, I don't think we want that visual yeah, yeah. in your book. And she said, well, Let's let's take that out. <laughs> so, but what we didn't know, what you you didn't know, I didn't know, is that that giant coiled snake is not the fiber and the roughage mm. that we ate. It's actually bacteria that have eaten the fiber. No way. And the bacteria inside of us? Oh, yeah. That's coming out. That's coming out. So most of your oh poop my gosh. is, if you will, baby bacteria. No way. And so the more... So we want to get the bacteria out of us? No, you want them to grow and prosper. And the more they grow and <laughs> it prosper... It's like a, aliens in our body. It's well, like you know, you're, us. you're absolutely right. And one of the things that is kind of hard to embrace is we we probably only exist as a place for bacteria to live on earth wow and and you know intelligence so if there was no bacteria inside of us we're done we would die so we know that we can breed germ-free mice an interesting fun fact that i put in the longevity paradox my fifth grade science project was to build a germ-free mouse environment. This was in 19, wow. 1960. Wow. Um, and so this isn't my first rodeo. <laughs> um, so, so we can build, we can raise germ-free mice that have no bacteria in them, have no bugs in them. And they live short lives. Really? They have horrible immune systems. They get and sick. They... they get sick, yeah. And they, so they're a basis of so much of what we know. And so you can, so bacteria are incredibly important. We know now that these bacteria actually teach our immune system from day one. In fact, scary we used to think that the placenta, where the, you know, the baby of the womb, the uterus, that feeds the baby is sterile. Of course it has to be, because the baby has to be sterile. The placenta is full of bacteria. Feeding, feeding the baby. That ba and it, it turns safe. out that the bacteria in the placenta actually give information to the baby's immune system before the baby even pops out of the womb. And so we need these viruses, these we, good viruses. We need these viruses and bacteria. We need them. Hmm. And in, in fact, fun fact, long ago, the only way to treat bacterial infections were viruses that could actually infect bacteria and kill viruses. And 
Eli Lilly Company from Indianapolis got its start, this giant pharmaceutical company, as what's called a bacteriophage company. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. And it turns out that viruses uh, actually are really useful in us as well. We have mm. trillions and trillions and trillions of viruses in us right now. What's the difference between a good virus and a bad virus? If the good virus is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, okay, let's, let's do a deep dive into microbiology. Okay, and what is the definition of virus? Okay, so a virus <clears throat> is probably the s smallest reproducible form of life, however we want to define life. <clears throat> So most living things are capable of reproducing themselves one way or another, mm. dividing or multiplying. multiplying one way or another. Just like humans. Exactly. So a virus, unfortunately, has to have, cannot replicate itself. It has to borrow another cell and tell, take over the cell's machinery to manufacture more copies of viruses. Mm. And that's how they get reproduced. But in the end, every living creature is here just to make a new copy. And you, know, you and I only, yeah. only exist uh, was to make a new copy. Wow. And, you know, I hopefully actually only exist so my bacteria can make new copies of them themselves. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a condominium yes. for my inhabitants. Duplication, yeah. And if, if they're happy and I'm a good landlord to them, they will keep the place nice. And yeah. they actually would like me to stick around a very long time because I'm their home. So if I give them, my tenants, what they want, uh, they'll keep me around. Okay. All right, so getting so, back to Terry Walls. Yes. So Terry Walls and her giant anacondas. And whenever we do a podcast with her uh, from Iowa, she has these dolls of poop. Um, really? Yeah. I gotta, I gotta oh, meet yeah, this person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, so um, we, uh, we've become friends through the years and our diets uh, recommendations are very similar and becoming more and more similar as time goes on. And recently she uh, and her wife uh, began doing time restricted feeding. Um, for the last 18 years during the winter, I only eat calories two hours a day. So mm -hmm. 22 out of 24 hours, wow. I'm not eating any calories. And I've done that for 18 years now. So that's, that's pretty interesting, time-restricted feeding. Time-restricted feeding means you limit the number of hours you eat in the day. Wow. Um, so she, and we had talked about this, so she and her wife actually really started doing this. And I, I see her about once a year, and I uh, noticed on, on the podcast, you know, she looks the best I have ever seen her. And so we're talking about this. And she said, well, you know, uh, I started, you know, after kind of reading and listening and, you know, longevity paradox, this, you, you know, this is something real. And this, not just me, other people have done this. Um, and we started doing it. And I started doing it. And then my wife said, you know, uh, there's something here. I'm going to join you. And they have kids. And now they, he, she's saying, our kids have noticed that we are getting younger. Mm. And, and I said, well, you know, this, you're right. I said, because, you know, I've known you through the years and you clearly <clears throat> are, you know, younger now than when I knew you a few years ago. And she said, yeah, our kids notice. And they're calling us, you know, Benjamin Button because right. uh, we're de-aging. So, I think this whole anti-aging thing is wrong. I think it is really quite possible to de-age. And as I talk about in the longevity paradox, what's fascinating is that, and you can prove this in animal models, that you age as your microbiome changes, number one, but more importantly, 
the, the wall of your gut is, should be impermeable, even though it's only one cell thick. And the surface area of your gut, my gut, is the same as a tennis court. So inside of you mm. and me is a tennis court. Crazy. Surface area. And the problem is that that wall of our gut is only one cell thick. And these cells are held together with uh, tight junctions. Uh, best example for anyone who's no longer young is Red Rover, Red Rover, which sure. we all played as a kid, yeah. where we locked arms and uh -huh. people ran across and a big guy locked I always you. ran through. Oh, oh yeah. let's go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're the guy, you know, and the two, Break two, the yeah, the two girls, go, ah, here comes Lewis. <laughs> ah. And they don't get to play that in school anymore, by the way. It's too dangerous. Oh, right. Yeah. Too Kids dangerous. get hurt. Because yeah. like, people like you. Yeah. <laughs> so they're all locked arm in arm. And as long as they're locked arm in arm, all those, you know, 100 trillion bacteria and all the other toxins stay on their side of the wall. On the other side of the wall, 60 to 70% of all your white blood cells, all your immune system is lined up on that wall. Why? Because that's basically the border. And if your invading army is coming through the border, mm -hmm. you want a guy you got you want to have your army on the other side. And what's cool is as long as that wall is intact, you do not age. Mm. But as that wall becomes leaky, and that's the whole story of leaky the law, gut, leaky, leaky gut. Yeah then you begin to age. And Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago, said all disease begins in the gut. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely right. All diseases begin, and I add on, end in the gut. I started manipulating the immune system by food. And sure enough, um, You've got an autoimmune disease, we can teach you to get rid of it by changing, primarily getting lectins out of your diet. That's it, huh? And changing your gut bugs to be basically friendly gut bugs. And the friendly gut bugs actually tell your immune system that, hey guys, we're all great down here. We're down at the beach. We're singing Kumbaya, yeah. the beautiful bonfire. And your immune system is basically the cops. Uh, and the cops go, oh, yeah, we know these kids, great kids. Uh, let's go have a donut. And now, so that's how it's supposed to be. But let's suppose a gang member moves into your neighborhood. Now, all of a sudden, you got, you're putting up bars on your windows and you got neighborhood watch patrols and you're shooting guys with hoodies without asking questions. So what's happened to most of us through some of the foods we eat, like all these wonderful snacks we're talking about, mm -hmm. we've, we've let these gang members loose. And the good guys actually can't eat simple sugars and these saturated fats. They, they want leaves and they want tubers. Mm. So they call, die off. They die off, exactly. So the gang members are running rampant, and now your immune system is going, oh my gosh, you know, the city's taken over by gang members, and we're going to have armed patrols everywhere, and anytime we see anything that looks a little odd, we're going to shoot and ask questions later. And so what's happened to everybody with autoimmune disease is their immune system is just hyper on guard because it's no longer getting the messages from the good bugs chill out, everything's cool, you know, kumbaya, love, 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 peace and love. And that's what's happened. And it's, it's so cool to get somebody who can just, you know, change the food they eat. They may not want it initially, but when they start feeling better, yeah. they go, uh, for instance, on Monday, young lady, 36 years old, lives out in uh, La Quinta, mm -hmm. uh, was sent to me with what's called chronic pain syndrome. Now, a lot of doctors toss this off as, oh, you're crazy or you're depressed or you're just anxious and you treat them with antidepressants. And she was in constant pain. And it was so bad that she actually had to work from home, mm. really couldn't move. And she had a kid and a husband. And right. so she had heard about me. She said, you know, I've heard about you. Um, you know, what do you think? And I said, 
come on, let's, let's do this. I said, what's happening is that your pain is actually coming from nerve cells inside your gut that are being stimulated by rogue uh, cops, if you will, and they're trying to tell you that you shouldn't move. Mm. Um, so let's start. So I saw her a couple of months later in January, February, and I said, how are we doing? She said, you know, the pain's less, but it's definitely still there. So I said, well, you know, just stay at it. If you mm -hmm. can feel a difference, don't give up. Yeah, yeah. So she, I walked in um, on Monday, and I almost didn't recognize her. <laughs> and I said, she's got a giant smile on your face. And I said, so, you know, how you doing? She said, perfect. I said, what, what do you mean? And she says, do you know what it's like to not have pain? And I said, well, yeah, I do um, <laughs> now. Uh, he, she said, I forgot what not having pain feels like. Wow. And it, it's amazing. She said, I just feel great. I, you know, it's been so many years, I'd forgotten what, you know, feeling normal felt huh. like. She said, but let me tell you a story. You can't cheat. And, I, <laughs> and I, I, I said, yeah, I know that, but how'd you find out? She said, well, you know, there was this office party a couple of weeks ago. And all they had, they had some, they had some chicken and they had some nachos and they had some guacamole. And she said, I noticed that the guacamole had tomatoes in it. Uh, believe it or not, guacamole is not have, supposed to have tomatoes. Your, your listeners should realize that guacamole <laughs> should not have tomatoes. Sure. But, uh, she said, I figured, well, the safest thing to eat is to put some guacamole on my plate and have a piece of chicken because, you know, I want to be nice. She said, I'll tell you, within an hour, oh. my left elbow just started throbbing, and then my hand started oh, freezing up. She said, I actually had to leave the party and go home. And she said, I had to lay down, and I couldn't get up for about two hours. And she said, and I was trying to be good. And she said, it's, it's amazing that, you know, this could do this. Wow. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. So you, said, you essentially came, was, uh, you know. Amazing. We're doing heart surgeries, 10,000 of them, and yeah. said, I don't want to be offensive here. I'll make sure I'm saying the right thing. But you're now essentially a functional med doctor. Yeah, I don't In, in a sense, correct. right? Correct. Um, with, not... all, with all due respects to Mark Hyman, yes. uh, Jeff Bland created the uh, created functional medicine, and Jeff's a friend of mine. I don't know what functional medicine is. Right, means. right, right. What I do is restorative medicine. Great. All of us have the power to heal ourselves. Now, the guy who said this was Hippocrates, and Hippocrates, uh, brilliant, he, he believed that any organism had the ability to have perfect health, hmm. and that every organism had the ability to achieve perfect health as long as the obstacles to perfect health were removed. Hmm. And Hippocrates believed that the physician's job was to identify the obstacles to that organism having perfect health, the patient, and remove them from the patient. And right. the patient would do the rest. Yeah. So what, what I try to do, I basically do detective work. And I think I'm pretty good at finding the obstacles. And many of those obstacles, believe it or not, are lectins. Mm. And the other obstacle is you got to get the gang members out of your gut by basically starving them to death and giving the good guys what they want to eat. Starving them of the lectins. Starving them of simple sugars yes. and lectins and saturated fats. Like you Remove those things. Yeah. They, they have nothing to eat and they leave. For instance, I'll give you an example of something interesting. Uh, we actually have bacteria in our gut that enjoy eating gluten uh electric. really yeah they love it but if you go gluten free they leave because they got nothing to eat yes and then a lot of people who go gluten free and don't notice a whole lot of difference or they just get frustrated and then they and they have a couple pieces of bread or mm. pizza mm. and Gosh, then all of a so sudden good. their gut goes oh you know well, it's because their bugs that could defend them against gluten are gone. Are gone. Oh. And it, believe it or not, gluten is kind of a, a low-level lectin. There's far worse. The, the worst ones are in the hall of the grain. So, for instance, this whole, whole grain goodness, 
This only started about 50 years ago. No such thing as whole grain goodness. No, we've gotten sicker and sicker and sicker because the outside of the hall (laughs) has the lectins. And we've been throwing it away. I mean, really, the French, seriously, would they have a whole grain croissant uh, or a whole grain baguette? Really? And the Italians, you know, whole grain pasta. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's appearing on the menus because the tourists want to see it. it. Yeah. But the Italians would kill themselves. Right, right. Yeah, the first thing I opened up right here is the most popular nut is not a nut, the peanut. The peanut. Oh, my gosh. And a cashew. A cashew is a nut, too. I can't eat cashews? No. The Amazonian Indians always threw the cashew bean away. Uh, what, if, what if I eat, <laughs> manipulate it in a certain way and make it into a sauce? And, you could pressure cook it. I can pressure cook cashews. Yeah. Then I can eat it. Yes. And what stay away from chia seeds. No chia seeds? No. These are all the things people are telling you to eat right now. I, of course. And that's why everybody's getting sicker. Chia seeds, there's two human studies that show that chia seeds promote inflammation in human beings. <laughs> What yeah. else do we need to be aware of? I used to be a big fan of chia seeds. What do you eat? Uh, you eat what you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to eat leaves. You're supposed yes. to eat tubers, uh, like jicama, like sweet potatoes, uh-huh. like rutabagas. You're supposed to eat tons of olive oil. Ton, really? Tons. I use a liter a week. Of olive oil? Of olive oil. You drink it or you're cooking no, it? With it I, no, I pour it on everything. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. pour it on everything. The only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. This is what I told Dr. Really? Oz a few weeks ago. Just think the only purpose of food is to get olive oil in your mouth. In Crete and Sardinia, they use a liter of olive oil per week. A Spanish study of 65-year-old people for five years, making them use a liter of olive oil per week against a low-fat Mediterranean diet, at the end of five years, the olive oil users had improved memory compared to the low-fat diet. The women had 65% less breast cancer wow. than the low-fat Mediterranean diet. And they had less heart disease. Liter a week. Olive oil. Liter a week. That's, can't, a, that's can't the fountain of youth, huh? Yeah. It really is. Olive oil. Olive oil. It's the secret. It's the secret. Okay. There you go. That's the secret. If you enjoyed this, make sure to click the subscribe button, like this video, and turn on that notification bell. And if you want to learn about the key foods you need to eat to master your health, make sure to watch this video right here. One out of two Americans have what we call type 2 diabetes. We used to call it adult onset, except now kids as young as three are getting type 2 diabetes from drinking soda.